Special thanks to our IT team here at the district office, uh, working remotely from their offices located nearby. Thanks for their efforts uh, today to help set up these meetings and for anyone who may be attending today um, or watching on our YouTube channel. A couple different ways to observe this uh, conversation and actually presentation. Um, there'll be opportunity later in the, in the meeting here that's set aside for a community meeting. If people have got questions, um, they can, if you've registered as a participant, you'll be able to join and make comment. Also found on the same webpage where you found this link is my email address. You can email me uh, any comments or suggestions regarding our distance learning plan. Um, as we know, we've, we're actually on day six of the school year for Central Union High School District. It's been six days now that our students and teachers have been working together on their learning. Uh, it's, we're all learning together how to do this better. Unlike the fourth quarter of the school year last year, uh, which was a little more of like, here's a packet, let's be safe and we'll touch base as soon as we can figure out what we're doing. But we've had summer school to work on this and we've worked really hard over the summer months to prepare for this, done quite a bit of extensive training of our staff to get them up to speed. Uh, those who need it, others are well ahead and they're advanced, they're training and helping colleagues right now, but our, our people who distance learning or online tools were new, provided lots of training and training opportunities, which are ongoing and so is the support for staff. So quite a bit of work has been done in preparing for um, the start of school and getting us to where we are now. So we're going to talk a little bit today about, uh, for us, the fall of 2020, this whole first semester doing distance learning. Um, myself, uh, I'm the superintendent, Ward Andrus, uh, here in the Valley, but all of our colleagues around the Valley and other districts are also doing the same. Some have started school, like Imperial Unified School District started yesterday, and other districts uh, around to start next Monday. So we're all trying to figure out these things as best we can, support our students and uh, work through all the various challenges that each school or school district faces that may be unique. We recognize as well that families are in unique situations. Uh, like my wife and I, it's just the two of us. All of our kids are grown and we don't have anyone at home. So balancing work and family is pretty easy for an empty nester couple. But we recognize we've got families of all kinds. We've got parents who both have to work and a high school student may be helping siblings during the day. We recognize that some of our students live with grandparents or different family members, and there's all kinds of conditions and access to technologies or you know, quiet learning spaces and so on. So we know that there's all different types of scenarios. And what we're trying to do with our efforts is to provide the, the most reasonable and responsible expectations while still providing flexibility for everyone. And that includes our teachers and our students um, to try and accomplish the goals of learning this fall and this school year in this new way that none of us really signed up to do, but here we are. So I'm going to share with you over the course of the next few minutes and the hour that we spend together uh, about 25 or so slides uh, on a slide presentation, and these are all taken from taken from a former board presentation that we had presented to our school board in the months of May, June, uh, August, and we'll have an update again in September. It'll be a little more formal as we get through more information. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this point in time. It'll take me a minute to get there. And I'm going to move to present mode. Great. So what we have here is this is just, our, of course, our cover. This is our road ahead. This is our August uh, version of where we're at right now. Um, again, things tend to change and move on us quite a bit. So we've received guidance for reopening schools. Uh, even though we worked um, with internally with lots of our own folks, our teachers, our counselors, administrators. We had what we called the think tank group. And we started meeting as early as April and May and met uh, often. I think we met about eight to 10 times in formal meetings plus lots of other conversations. But we finally received guidance from the state of California, the Department of Education. They provided us information in the month of June. As we were finishing school and people were going on vacation and we had started summer school, they produced this document. It really was general guidelines. Didn't give specific directives for us to follow, but it gave us lots of, of guidance. Things like following local health official requirements, practicing physical distancing, and getting your distance learning plan together. Also to bring students on campus when it's practical, meaning when it's safe and you can actually do this. They also informed us that we would receive a 60-day supply of PPE, the famous letters, PPE, personal protective equipment, for teachers and for students. And that would be coming throughout the school year. And we've already received our first uh, supply. 
We received additional guidance from Imperial County Office of Education. This really mirrored and reflected much of what the state had provided to us already. Uh, but again, guidelines, not specific directives, similar things follow the health direct uh, requirements, physical distancing, and so on. The County Office of Education became the distributor of the 60 day supply of PPE for us, and they'll continue to fulfill that role. Um, the previous uh, slide that you saw, the one from the Department of Ed and this one, both documents are available on our webpage. And we'll talk about that webpage in a few minutes. The County Health Department also has their own roadmap to recovery. And as conditions change or variances are provided or changes in what we learn, this roadmap is adjusting as we all know, and we've experienced it. Uh, we can return our students back to campus in small groups when we reach stage 2B. We started out in stage one, we went to stage 2A for a while, and then back in July when we had our local surge of cases and illnesses, we, they moved us back to stage one. Uh, so it's only essential work. And it's been clarified, if there's ever a question, the county um, health department has clarified that all uh, school district employees are essential workers and uh, may be required to report to work in person if needed. Um, however, we found lots of ways to accommodate needs and, and to keep us as safe as possible. The health department does require a daily health screening for our employees. It does not have to be a temperature check and it does not have to be an active one where someone else is checking you. You can do a self check. And so that's part of our plan. We do have physical distancing precautions in place. If you visit our campuses right up front when you get to the gate, you've got to have a mask. We talk about physical distancing, their signage, hand sanitizer and things like that. Uh, we do have purchased additional equipment for uh, enhanced sanitizing, not just cleaning surfaces, but it's sanitizing surfaces at all of our campuses. And we continue to order more equipment and more supplies to make sure we have plenty of that on hand to keep our facilities, not just clean, but sanitized. So what occurred is in the state of California is the Senate Bill 98 was signed into law on June 29th by Governor Newsom. And this is the part that gives us schools the rules for how schools are to be conducted and how schools are funded this year. So the, the real crux of this very long document is found in a paragraph um, and they talk about daily live interaction. Daily live interaction is, is what is with a certificated employee and peers for the purpose of instruction, progress monitoring and maintaining school connectedness. This interaction may take the form of internet or telephonic communication or other means permissible under public health orders. So there's a little misconception out there that the only way to do this is with an hour long video call per class in high school. That is not what that says. Um, it says daily life interaction. And so, and we recommend though, that the best form is probably a video conference for a period of time. And it depends on how, what's happening in the class. Um, if it's a very complex type of instruction, then the instructions or that video call should be longer. Um, if it's a get to know you and I'm trying to get to know all my, my students and my classmates, that may be a longer phone call or a video call uh, or interaction. But if it's something that's a little more simple, such as, hey, we're going to go over this assignment today and here's the instructions about it. This ends the call, but I'm going to stay available for you. Um, that may be a 10 to 20 minute video conference or interaction. So what, what this does is this allows some flexibility for um, families and students as well, as well as our teachers about what this looks like. We, again, we recognize not everyone has the same technologies at home. We'll talk about devices and access to devices. And we have ways to solve those problems that families may be experiencing. But the daily live interaction is daily. So every single school day, and there are 180 school days in the school year. For us, I think we have 174 left to go because we're just on day six. Um, and that's Monday through Friday, every one of those school days, there should be daily live interaction with, with your classmates. Um, and so we're, we're working in this direction to help us understand our goal, our, our expectation is this is for all classes. But if you look closely, the law does not say that. Uh, but we are striving so that all of our classes have daily live interaction. And we are some teachers who are still working on figuring out how to do that or getting their technologies to work. So this is a work in progress. Part of the law also says we are required to take attendance daily and monitor weekly progress, monitor that every week. So this is kind of, it's similar in nature, but it's really two different things. So daily attendance, teachers are marking attendance in ARIES. ARIES is our student information system and they mark it every day, every class period. 
And they're also following up with anyone who's missing or not, not participating with counselors and administrators on their staff to be doing follow-up. So we're also monitoring progress. Um, teachers are keeping weekly records of that progress, meaning they're turning in assignments, they're marking their grade books down. Teachers monitor and report students that are falling behind. So again, counselors, administrators, and other staff can do outreach and follow up. We are working on getting our tutoring set up. We have instructional aids for students that's also already in place to help students who may be struggling. So teachers are actually marking, I'm gonna go back up to that top bullet just for a minute. Teachers are marking attendance for three different ways. One is that they are present in that video or phone call, that daily live interaction we just talked about. If they are participating right there, um, if they're there on it, they take attendance who's on logged on in that event, um, those students are marked as engaged, right? Because they're engaged in online learning. Um, students who are, who are doing the work, but not maybe at the class time, but get their assignment turned in, we're marking those students that they are involved, what we call asynchronously, meaning that they're, it's not synced up with a class, it's at a different time, but they're getting the work done. And we know that's the case for many students. Some students who may have to help a sibling may not be able to get on the phone call or the video call with their teacher at nine o'clock because they're helping their sibling um, or, or they have a different family situation of some kind. But later in the day or in the week, they're getting their work turned in. We're also marking students that are not engaged at all. They're not doing schoolwork and they're not coming to any of our video or our interactive uh, classes. And so they're just missing. And we like to report a very high participation rate. We're actually over 90% of our students on the very first day were participating in their classes, which was terrific to see. So what we did before even school even started, we, we updated our registration options. Um, some of you experienced it and it was a struggle in some cases, in other cases, it was pretty seamless. So the traditional paper packet, we actually improved that. It may not have felt like it, but we did. We eliminated a handful of forms, uh, simplified them, reduced the amount of paper we were printing and providing to families uh, by adding links to resources that are found online. We also offered online registration. This was done through the ARIES parent portal and we're working to improve that. Uh, but this, we had, we had done it years ago and we restarted it this year. And really it's a student data confirmation process because really all you're doing is editing or, or double checking the information that's already online for your student. And if it's all still correct, you can go through that process by clicking buttons uh, to complete registration. And that saved, uh, it was safer because it's done at home or on your phone. Um, you didn't have to come into a facility or a, one of our schools and drop off paper packets. Um, we hope to improve that process because this was only available for returning 10th, 11th and 12th grade students. So even freshmen, all of our freshmen or new to the district students had to report in person with a traditional packet. So we, we did try and find new ways to help students register to make it easier for our families and for students. I mentioned before devices. Um, we have additional Chromebook and what we call MiFi devices for Borderlink. So let me talk a little about each one of these. A Chromebook is a laptop. It's kind of a simplified laptop, um, works great with Google Chrome and Google Classroom. It's really designed for use on the internet. So it's streamlined, it's a simple device, uh, but it's got a keyboard, has a camera, a microphone, speakers. It's a great device for learning. Um, they're lightweight, um, as long as they're cared for, um, they, the battery will last almost the entire day. Um, they're great devices. That's called a Chromebook. To this point in time, um, we have distributed over 2,100 Chromebooks to date, and we're handing them out to every individual student who is requesting one. Um, a MiFi device is a device used uh, to connect to the internet. So it's a small little device, it lights up, it's gotta be powered up, but it's like your home device that connects to the Wi-Fi or connects to the internet from your local internet service provider. But Borderlink is actually our own network here in the county for educational and government purposes. Borderlink is like Verizon or AT&T, it is wireless internet but it's for, again, education and government purposes only, and you have to have a specific MiFi device to connect to Borderlink. So if anyone is having, they may have a computer or a laptop, but they're struggling with internet connection, which would be none of you on this call because you're all on the call watching. But if you know someone who needs connection like that, a device either for internet connection or a Chromebook, please have them contact the school. We are still handing them out, they're still available. We've ordered more Chromebooks and we have more um, in storage if needed to make sure we, every student has one. 
if someone says, I don't have a device, that's simply an excuse. We have a solution and we can help students do that. So again, we're providing a Chromebook to each student, not one per household. So if you have multiple high school students um, in the home, each one needs their own device. We're not likely to ever return Chromebooks on those carts that kids are used to seeing in the classroom uh, because of sanitization purposes. Um, I think even when we return in the future, a year, two years, three years from now, it'll always be in the back of our mind, like who used it last, who sanitized it. So we're actually moving towards a one-to-one -one initiative where every student will have their own device. And either they'll bring one from home if they want something better than a Chromebook um, or higher quality, et cetera, um, or one that would be issued to them. So we're working on that over the course of these next um, you know, 12 to 24 months, the next one to two school years to make sure every student is issued a Chromebook um, or they have their own device because they will be needed. And um, as our teachers have learned, there's a lot of great things we can do with, with distance learning um, or blended learning with resources online. Um, and also the issue about uh, whose device or who touched it. So we're moving that direction. Textbooks. Our teachers provided a list of needed textbooks before school started. Um, students have come in and they picked up books when they got their schedule. Not all courses need a textbook. Some have online textbooks where the entire uh, textbook itself, plus all of its connected videos or links or resources are also online and they're very, very rich. They're terrific, terrific resources found online. So, but they've been distributed. So if your student thinks they're supposed to have a textbook, they just need to check with their teacher. Um, a couple of our teachers got their lists in late and our textbook uh, staff and our staff at the, at the schools are also working on distributing books. And so if you still need books, please contact your teacher or school to make sure you've got all the resources because we are distributing textbooks. Now we started school last Tuesday and this is how we, we started the year. Again, distance learning for all students to get the year going. So that was all students, every single one. And we really cannot introduce students back on campus in groups until we get to stage 2B. And we are right now back in stage one. Um, there was recently, if you saw something in the news, there was, a, I think on Friday, the governor made an allowance that certain uh, courses or certain groups of students um, may return. Um, we have to uh, make sure the facilities are safe and we have a couple processes in place for student safety and teacher safety. And those would really be some of our special education classrooms and really the highest need special education classrooms. Um, I believe our County Office of Education that operates classrooms on our facilities will be starting their um, on-site classes soon. So you'd wanna check with your teacher about that. If, you're a, if you have a special education student, check with them. Um, so those, we are still working through what those steps look like and being prepared for that. I believe the county classrooms, county run classrooms will start sooner than ours. So to make sure that we're all safe, we have safety precautions and expectations for everyone coming onto campuses. Uh, we've been in this evacuation pandemic now and, and stay at home for now almost six months. So our plans are aligned and they've been approved with the County Health Department and our County Office of Education. Again, like mentioned before, a daily health screening prior to coming to work or to school. No temperature taking is required, but it would be available. We have the touchless temperature scanners at all of our locations. If someone is not quite sure um, they want to have their temperature taken, we have that there to be taken. Masks are required when people cannot maintain six feet of physical distancing. So for example, I am in my office and there's no one here, so I don't need to wear a mask. But when I'm up and walking down the hall in the district office, everyone here is wearing a mask. And we stop to talk to people in their offices, we are all wearing masks. Um, so we, we will do the same when we are back in school and we'll also require it when we're walking during passing periods that uh, masks will be required then when we have students on campus. There are signs and reminders posted throughout the schools and the offices. They're already there uh, that we have reminders up there, markers on the ground and so forth. There's hand sanitizer and hand washing regularly as expected. And we're also in daily sanitizing of schools and buses. To help in this effort, we're actually working on um, replacing our regular sinks and paper towel dispensers with contactless one, like the motion sensor, you pass your hand and the water comes on or the paper towels are dispensed. So we're working to improve those facilities so they are contactless. So 
one of our primary concerns is what we're talking about is what we call equity and learning loss. And that's highlighted here in bold and, and underlined. Equity means all of our students don't have the same access to, um, to resources. Some families are able to hire a tutor at home, whereas other families, were, they're really just struggling to, um, to make the ends meet. So we recognize that not everyone's in the same situation. And also since the third end of the third quarter, it has not been the same type of learning and we're not, we weren't really ready for it, uh, for this type of change. So we recognize that not all students have been able to keep up and continue learning. So some of that has been lost. So as soon as it is safe and we are able to, we want to introduce on-campus classes and meetings. And let me distinguish these. And we will, I'll demonstrate next up our different phases of reopening, different than the county stages. We use the word phase. But some of our small class meetings may be a CTE class, let's say a culinary uh, class or a construction class. That teacher and students may say, all right, we're gonna have a short lab for the three of you on Wednesday at nine o'clock, right? And so students will be able to come in and uh, meet with their teacher for a period of time, probably on the schedule, their class period, and do a small lab activity. Our English learners, our special education students that we talked about, maybe a science teacher wants to get a lab done and an in-person lab so we can bring in small groups of students. Also, we have tremendous, as you know, music and performing groups uh, between the SABAPA program at Southwest and, um, and the um, great Spartan band at, at, um, at Central. We have tremendous, tremendous musical performing groups. And so we wanna be able to figure out how can we bring them back together? So we've developed what we call phases of instruction. And again, what's driving these decisions is equity for all students. Everybody's got access and get, making up learning loss. We know we've got gaps because we just haven't been able to be together and teach the same way. So again, phase one is distance learning for all. That's where we are right now, all students for distance learning. We don't know how long this will last, uh, but in our county, because of our conditions, this may be for a prolonged period of time more than a few weeks. This is gonna go on for a while for us. We will then in phase two, as we introduce small groups by subject in limited numbers to maintain physical distancing. That's what I just described. These small little groups that kind of specific ones based on the course content, what's in the class, um, those activities would be small groups. And we can't do that for a while until we get to stage 2B. As we progress through the different stages in 2B, we can maybe introduce students um, as we like 25% of the class, when a fourth of the class comes to in person, um, but the rest of the class is working online that day. And then we, as again, as conditions allow and physical distancing is, le is lessened, that requirement of six feet, we can, we can introduce students um, from just one day a week to two days a week, and that'd be half of the students. For example, this may be a Tuesday, Thursday group and a Wednesday, Friday group, and you'd come twice a week uh, Mondays would be distance learning for all on our minimum day schedule. Again, and when conditions allow, this is our phase five, all students can return back to the full school day. So this is what our, our preliminary plan that we think this is our best one. I know that some of our neighboring districts have different models, different uh, methods of doing this, uh, but this is the one that we felt we could do that would be best for our high school students at this point in time. So we wanna make sure our, we have tools and services for our teachers and students. And we wanna reduce the confusion and we want to um, streamline things. So to help this happen is we, over the summer, made sure all students had a new uh, Gmail account, was, which was owned and uh, the account is owned by the school district and it's assigned to a student. And there's information on our webpage about these new Gmail accounts. They are so important and necessary because it improves the communication process. By having them linked inside the district uh, account and having this new student email account, um, it also provides, provides many safeguards. Um, when a teacher sees that all, only students with the appropriate Gmail account are in the class, we know that strangers aren't in there or someone trying to you know, cause problems can't get in to those classes or those video calls because we're using these very narrow, very specific Gmail accounts that are district provided. That was essential. We have what's called G Suite for Education. This is oftentimes called Google Classroom, but Google Classroom includes the Google Meet function, which is the video conference, it includes Google Stream, which is the threaded discussions. It includes um, Google Docs. And we've seen Docs and Sheets, and this is actually presentation is done on Google Slides. So, but we want to upgrade it to the enterprise solution, which gives us more features and more safeguards. 
Many teachers are using remind.com. Remind is a great tool to distribute and communicate via text message, which kids love to do. Um, and lots of adults do. Matter of fact, someone tried to text me just a minute ago. Um, so remind is a great way. And this also keeps everyone's phone numbers hidden. So you get a message from a random number, but you know it's your teacher because it comes through as a remind. And that can also work on a Chromebook. You can have go to this, the remind page and do it through your Chromebook, not just your phone. So if a student doesn't have a phone, they can still use Remind through their Chromebook. We're also purchasing additional technology hardwares to support our distance learning and what we call in the future, a flipped classroom. So distance, and these are hardware things like headsets, microphones, cameras, scanners, um, a writing stylus pad for annotating images or um, a presentation. So we recognize that not all of our teachers have all the tools that they need. So we've set aside uh, nearly over $40,000 of our local budget to just support ancillary technologies, make sure our teachers have equipment. And within the week, our teachers should have access to that, to that list and start getting that equipment delivered to them. We've distributed over 100 or 50 cameras already and, and more is on the way. To help our students and actually help with something else about meal distribution, we're adding Wi-Fi to our buses. We're adding Wi-Fi devices to our buses, the same ones that connect to Borderlink will soon be available on all of our buses. Um, in the short run, we need this because when we, when we distribute meals in remote locations, we need access to internet, which will be Borderlink. But in the future, when students are riding buses, they can be working on their assignments. They can do other things, uh, checking their email from their teachers on the bus ride home with their Chromebook that's been checked out to them and they can connect to the Wi-Fi on the bus, which connects to Borderlink. So uh, we're adding that, it's a great resource. Meals are only for registered students, but meals are free this year. I didn't put that word in here on this slide. Meals are free for students, but only for registered students. If you were a family that picked up meals during the, the spring uh, or continue to do so during the summer months with a different district, uh, they was called part of a, the, the federal government's seamless summer meal program and was for any child ages eight, or excuse me, ages zero to 18 years old. The federal government has not continued that and we're back to the regular rules. So you must be a registered student and um, they are they, but they are free this year. We worked out a system to where they can be free for all students. We are doing meals curbside at all three schools between nine, and we'll see a slide on that in just a minute, at all three of our high schools. And we're going to be delivering meals to our feeder neighborhoods out in different communities uh, nearby and deliver like at one of our bus stops. We'll set up a little station and people, students can come by or uh, a parent can come by on the behalf of the student and pick up a meal for their, their child. So in addition to all of these things, we recognize that some students need additional help. So support for students. And this is divided into, we use the word tiers, but another way to think of this is levels, right? So basic level one, everybody gets level one. That's our classroom instruction. That's taking attendance. That's uh, working with teachers. That's you know reaching out to a counselor. Um, that's regular service that all students get. But we know some students need a little extra help. They need to have a conversation with a counselor, they're struggling with a course, um, they're struggling with a peer or something, um, or they need some tutoring services. And so these are what we call tier two or level two support. And this is available to students, to all students, but it's really targeted for those who have an additional need. Like something isn't quite right, they need a little extra help to get over that hump, uh, but it's available then for them. For, we call that level two services. Level three services is when things are a little more tough and students need much more help than just these basic counseling services or tutoring. So we have uh, connections to the County Behavioral Health Services. We also have community service outreach through our community liaisons. For especially our students who are maybe foster youth or homeless or English learners, they may need much more additional support, or maybe they're a migrant student. Again, those are specific programs for specific groups, and these are things that we call tier three services and interventions. Um, and so they are these additional support services. Again, everyone gets instruction. Everyone has access to teachers. That's for everyone. But sometimes we need to support students with extra help. And so we're building those in. These exist when we're in in-person instruction. We're, we're building these for our online services as well. Lots of questions have come up around this. Athletics, extracurricular activities, or what we call co-curricular activities. These are activities that uh, we're used to, like band performances, football games, um, cross country, golf, and so on. So the CIF, uh, the first bullet there on the slide, the CIF announced there will be no sports this fall. 
CIF is the California Interscholastic Federation. And they announced there's no sports this fall. They have merged fall and winter into the winter season and winter and spring into the spring season. So they've kind of mushed them all around a little bit. We are hopeful. We are hopeful that conditions will allow us to have um, a winter season that's fall winter together. We're hopeful those conditions continue and we can do something in the spring. So there's more information about this on the CIF webpage. If you go to our webpage, which I provide the link a little bit later, I believe, um, you can find our COVID recovery uh, plan. There's a link to CIF so you can find them. Um, athletics will follow the guidance set forward by them. And these are things like football helmets don't go home with the student, they have to stay at school so they can be sanitized. Um, even the officials, they can't change in our locker rooms if they're coming from work or from home or wherever they're coming from. Oftentimes officials come in, they change in their, their official outfits, um, their uniforms in one of our facilities um, and they can't, they have to do that elsewhere and come straight to the court or field. So there's all kinds of rules and guidelines to keep, uh, to minimize the possible spread of COVID-19. Other activities will follow the similar phases of instruction. Like when we're able to have students on classrooms, we can have after school practices, we can have after school events, we can have performances and rehearsals. When permissible, we can start adding public or larger group to the public. It is possible that a local football game may be played in an empty stadium, but it's just the athletes. Maybe we can add immediate family members, but it will probably be a while until we can add all the fans back. So think of it in terms of the same way we see in the community with these slow progressive openings, the same types of things will happen around sports and our um, extracurricular and co-curricular activities. Child nutrition, as I mentioned before, we are going to be providing um, breakfast and lunch, two meals a day, and it's free to all registered students. So if you, have a, if you are a Central Union High School District student at any one of our four campuses, um, that's Southwest High School, Central Union High School, Phoenix Rising or Desert Oasis High Schools, it is for those students. It's daily pickup at all three high schools, all three locations, Southwest, Central and Desert Oasis. Um, that's between 9.30 and 11.30. So we have staff available, meals are there for pickup, um, distribution, um, you walk up like we did in the, in the springtime, uh, we set the meals um, on the table, um, step back, and then the family member can pick it up and, and go forward. The difference is we probably we now need to have the student show, um, have the registration process. And that information is available on our website about showing student IDs and so forth. Um, remote delivery begins next week, August 24th. We'll begin remote delivery next Monday, the 24th, and then again the next day on Wednesday, the following day. So what we'll do is bring multiple meal packs. Uh, we're, we're providing it twice a week with uh, kits of meals that are breakfast and lunch. These are our tentative locations where, we, uh, where we're sending um, folks out to at different times at 10 o'clock. And so our bus drivers are helping, our food service people are helping to distribute meals to families. So there's the KOA or it's a, a campground facility on, a, on 375 East Ross. There's a location in Sealy, one in Heber, um, Geos and Kennedy, a couple more here in El Centro. So um, more information can be found on our website around this, but this slide shows that we're doing remote meal delivery um, beginning Monday, um, August 24th. And if, if something changes, the best way to go is to look at the website under child nutrition and find the latest updates on locations, times, and how this may change. And we'll put a link on the main webpage to child nutrition so you can find it right quickly. The, the, the real feature about what's happening is this ability for us to be flexible and because there, there will be adjustments and we need to communicate. Um, one of the challenges, and it's very difficult, all of us are experiencing this fatigue and stress of the unknown. Um, it was very difficult when this first happened in March and April, and it was been very difficult in the month of July trying to sort through what will this be like, and teachers and, and parents and families, we know this was very, very stressful for us. Um, we also need to communicate with everyone that things may change. And as the county or as the state provides additional guidance or rules finally come out from auditors around attendance, is that what we currently think today may be different a few weeks from now. However, we're doing our best to think forward and plan forward with the most flexible and reasonable planning um, so we can accommodate those types of adjustments. So again, we know that conditions will change during this summer and throughout the school year. Um, things will be changing for us. We really have to be a flexible in our approach and not get locked into one set pattern. Um, 
We'll be making changes on who's attending on campus, group sizes, and meeting types. All of our official communications will come through the district webpage. And even our social media will point people back to the district webpage. Um, announcements that come through social media, our own district social media or school social media may have a brief little snippet, but it is going to point back to the district website for official communications. We have a web page. Um, if you go to our district web page, uh, cuhsd.net, and there's a tab underneath on the bottom that says COVID-19 recovery plan. Um, and this link will be live when you get that, when you see the PDF version of this, the document posted online. But COVID-19 is the recovery plan page. It's where all of our communications are living. We have links there. All of our documents will be there. Even the student and employee daily health screening document is there right now. Um, our approved uh, opening plan uh, provided by the county for us to open up of our offices and our facilities, that is also there for review. So all these things are on that page. Again, that's where the link to uh, CIF and the athletics is also located there. So we encourage everyone to get your news from the official sources, um, and that is our district webpage. So uh, the state also requires that we provide what's called a learning continuity and attendance plan. And that's really because what happened in the fourth quarter is districts, again, we were trying our best and kind of making it up as we went along and, and as we know, it wasn't very routine or rigorous sometimes. Sometimes the activities were very minimal. Um, some classes were much more structured and others were very, very loose. So now the learning continuity attendance plan gives us much, much more guidance and requirements for us. So along those lines, the state said, you have to have your plan adopted by September 30th by the board. So we have to have public input and review. And that's what we're doing today. This is part of the process is giving public input. Our plans include our instruction and participation, and we've shared with you about online daily live interaction. Attendance tracking, and we shared with you how we do that. We talk about technologies and hardware, our tiered intervention, and how we're students with social emotional supports, which is part of the tiered intervention plan. Um, we have to have a public hearing in a separate meeting. So on October 15th, we will have in a, uh, that date is incorrect, because I shouldn't say September. Oh, by September 30th, that's correct. So on September 15th, my mistake, on September 15th is our public hearing, and on September 29th is our approval at the next board meeting. So we have some meetings coming up, coming forward in these, and um, I'll update this slide uh, so that we have those specific dates on there. So again, community input meetings are happening right now. This is the first one, August 18th at 11. There's another one this evening at 6 p.m. if you want to share this link or have other people watch. Um, uh, next week on Tuesday, el 25 de agosto, a las 11 y también a las 6 de la noche. Uh, we'll have Spanish. I'm going to do my very best to do the same meeting, but in Spanish. Um, I think I can pull it off, but we'll have a translator. So if you have, if you know of people who are Spanish only speakers, um, point them to these dates and times so they can listen in on the same presentation and the slides will be in Spanish and uh, we'll have Spanish meeting at that point in time too. So at this point in time, it's really open if the if people who are participating, who register to participate, if you have any comments or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. And either this is great, or yeah, have you thought about this, or I know this resource, we'd love to hear from the community and get any inputs and thoughts that you may have. So we'll wait a few minutes and um, wait to hear from our technology team to find out if there's anybody who wants to make any comments. You can also send me an email, like I mentioned before, and that's also found on the same page that you found for, um, for uh, to register for this is my email address. It looks like we do have a comment come from, from someone. So I think they can elevate you so you can make that comment. Is that Miss Estrada? Is she able to come online and ask the question? Just a minute. She needs to uh, unmute her microphone. I'll chat with her here in a minute. You can unmute your mic and speak.
Okay, while we're waiting for Miss uh, Estrada to come online, there's a in the chat. There's a question that says, "I'm wondering if if somewhere I can get guidance on how to use Google Classroom." Yes, there's a great resource on how to use Google Classroom. Let me actually go while I'm on here because I can go grab it right now. I'm going to put it the link right here for you. So, these tools right here. Copy, paste it right here. Okay, so for everyone who's participating, if you follow this link, this is resources for students and families. This link is also found on that COVID-19 recovery page. Um, it's a great link on what to do and how to do it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for just a minute. Uh, so while we're on this, I'll circle back to Mrs. Estrada's question. So I'll share my screen just briefly for a moment and share this. Um, hopefully you've got, so what you're seeing here is this is the link that's there. It brings you down to check your bell schedule. Um, how do you get to your area student portal? How do you uh, log on to areas to get to your classrooms? Um, know your, your Google account information. This is how you get help for your, if you need help with your Google account, you can click there and fill out a survey and people will help you. Visit a Google classroom. And then all this, these are all links on how do I access my classroom? Uh, how do I respond to questions? And parents, these are great videos for parents and students on how to make this work, okay? So this resource is live and available right now for people to go and get help if they'd like to see that. So uh, the question that came through, it came through chat instead. Um, I think everyone that has done up to this point, however, just recently, there's been many disruptions to learning in one of my daughter's classroom. I want to know when there's a breach of security, is the district aware of it? Uh, yes, as soon as that happens, because we're, again, there are breaches that are happening. Um, a couple of teachers were using some tools and they had a couple of features, safety features not turned on. So for example, to attend a, a Google Meet classroom or Google Classroom video conference, they have to use their district email address. But the teacher has to make sure that little switch is turned on. So we're working to fix those things as soon as we come up with that either that we can fix it for teachers or teach teachers how to fix it so we can do that. When and if those things happen, we're asking that teachers report that to school administrators because discipline is still happening. Um, so if students are being inappropriate in class or posting something inappropriate, it's no different than them saying something bad in class and the teacher has to, to address it uh, or they get referred to an administrator. So yes, as soon as, as soon as we know about those disruptions, we want to address them. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, next question. Can teachers make classes syllabus available to parents so we can be aware of the requirements? Yes, we ask them to post them to their Google page, but you may not have access to it the same way students do. And, um, and so we can work with our teachers to make sure those get distributed home uh, to classes via email. Um, they should have your information through some of the tools that we have online as well. So that should also be there. Um, okay, this is, I'm jumping around on different topics. <clears throat> okay, so around, the, there's uh, just a follow up to the question about disruptions in class. Um, she was wondering if there's a, a policy around that to share with parents. Um, we'll make we'll work on that around sharing it with parents around that. Ask the principals to make sure they communicate around disruptions in class. Uh, I know that they have been uh, working on that when those situations came up. I know on the first day there were some things that were inappropriate, and uh, the teacher was not quite sure how to turn off the camera. So they're all learning how to do that. Um, so some of those things are being worked on um, and being addressed in the classroom. So I can share that information with principals as well. Um, a friend talking about a, a Spanish only speaker, but they're receiving automated calls in English only, and they don't understand. Agreed. Uh, that's, that's why we're doing this meeting next week in Spanish for our Spanish speaking families. Um, that is a, a, something that we need to have our teachers also do is make sure they uh, have the Spanish part done. So those are reminders for them. Okay. Question here, my son's algebra teacher is not allowing late work. Is this appropriate during the initial phase of distance learning? So in some cases, um, you need to communicate with the family or the teacher about why you need some an extension on time. 
Um, no different than in, when we do in-person instruction, there's oftentimes um, unexpected uh, challenges that happen, things that arise. And so I think it's best to communicate with your teacher if you're having trouble, if your student's having trouble getting things turned in on time. Um, this is not, unlike the fourth quarter, this is not just an open-ended, do it whenever you want to. Uh, we need to get back into the pattern of learning um, and the regularness of school. So if there's an extenuating circumstance, something that's getting in the way of being able to stay on, on track with that, please communicate with your teacher and counselor um, on that. And they, all their information can be found uh, through different emails. Uh, someone else here posted at the bottom, many teachers had parents sign the syllabus as an assignment on the first day. So some of our teachers were able to make these class syllabuses available as part of it and got them to students and the student had parents get a copy and sign it and turn it back in. That's not all. So we'll make sure that that's a directive for teachers that they need to make sure all of that is done. We are working on um, a back to school night. Uh, oftentimes teachers can ask or parents get to meet teachers and ask questions on back to school nights. Uh, but this is really making this giant thing happen this way digitally is probably not going to work out very well uh, with a big, you know, Google Meet or, or video conference type activity. So we're working on a Google, uh, excuse me, a back to school night uh, scenario where we would have teachers uh, make a, you know, vi short video or slide presentation available uh, to parents and then have an opportunity for an interaction. So we're working on how to, how to carry that out, but we don't have that solution in place yet. Uh, most uh, Next question, what if a student needs to print documents and they don't have a printer? Yeah, we're trying to sort that one out. We're not, uh, not sure which classes those are. I would, if that's the case, I would let the teacher know like we don't have a printer. Um, some teachers may be expecting printed documents, but we don't know how we can expect that because we're not going to provide printers to families. So they need to do electronics, electronic uh, paper, uh, electronic work, not uh, printed documents. Um, so if if someone has to print something out, I would let them know that we, the family doesn't have a printer and that we would uh, let the, I'll probably also an administrator or counselor know. And so we'll make that correction because we don't uh, anticipate having to print everything. So it says my daughter's math class is having live class twice a week. Do you think that's ideal for the best instruction time? So again, going back to what the law reads, and, and I think there's, again, uh, come to understand that daily live interaction does not mean a daily video call. We recommend video calls on a regular basis. And I've told staff at least three to four times per week for the first part of the school year. I also said if, if instruction or the content is very complex, you need to spend more time doing video conference, video call type work. Simply posting an assignment in a video link is not adequate. Um, so. There may be other activities happening, because again, in the chat, it says twice a week. If there's other interactive uh, things happening, such as a threaded discussion or a phone conference or something on those lines, other than video, that may be taking the place. Um, and you can also always out, reach out to the teacher and say, uh, or the student can talk to the teacher and say, I need more help. Can I meet with you so you can discuss this with me further, right? Um, just because someone says I'm having two or three video calls a week doesn't mean you can't ask for help. Teachers are required to have office hours posted as part of their syllabus of when they're available for student contact, which is oftentimes their prep period. Sometimes it's after school. These are great questions. These are great ones to ask. And our, I know our principals have also been hosting uh, parent meetings. Uh, and the principals are the ones who can also deal more directly with, with your classroom teachers because they supervise the teachers. Um, here at the district office, I'm you know, kind of a one, one layer removed, uh, but I can certainly work with our principal on this. So if you have specific questions about a specific teacher or class, like this is only happening in my math class, but all my other classes are fine, make sure you're contacting your, your teacher asking for help, uh, more help than what they're currently offering uh, in terms of direct time. And then also reach out to the principal or counselor and let them know that this is a challenge and need some support. Um, teach, principals are aware that this is happening and working to help our teachers uh, you know, increase their, their time when they're spending with students. Again, like I mentioned, this is all new for all of us, for both parents and students and administrators and teachers. Um, all of us are learning how to get this done. And we're learning as we go. We're learning as we go. Um, so uh, be, please be patient with us. Bear with it that you know we're... We're all learning how to do this for the first time. As I told folks, there are no veteran teachers in our system right now. 
There are no veteran administrators of distance learning right now in our system. So uh, we'll, we're trying to work through these things as quick as we can. Okay. Well, I see all of our questions came through chat. Um, are there any other questions that people would like to post in the chat or make a comment uh, publicly? So, and one just came through, thank you. How do you get a hold of tutors for math and science? Yes, math and science. Uh, the tutors we have currently right now, um, we have, we have instruction, well, this is kind of a long question, but there's not one specific for math and science. So if a student is a special education student, we have instructional aids to help along with the teachers. Um, if a student is an English learner, then we have our English learner instructional aids and tutoring services available. And, but specific to math or science, uh, we also are working on trying to get our AVID tutors re-employed and so we can get that information posted. A general tutoring service uh, for all students is not yet available. We're working on getting that up and running. Part of it too is getting employees. Some of our folks who did the tutoring have taken other jobs or may have moved away and are not available to us at the moment. So we're working on getting those systems back up to speed. So I think if they need tutoring, they can also simply reach out to their teacher and say, I need some additional time. When can I meet with you during your office hour? <clears throat> Question here, are different districts working together to discuss pain points and strategies that are working? Yes, every Wednesday at 9 a.m., all superintendents from across Imperial County meet for about one to two hours every single week. Uh, we share resources, we share ideas, what's working, what's not working. Um, so we do that on a regular basis. Um, some of the things that we have done, we have shared with other districts and what other districts have done, they've shared with us and we are making them our own, kind of reinventing them or um, adopting them outright. Like This is great, we're just gonna take this service and do it. Um, again, keep in mind that all districts have their own teachers unions and classified employee unions. So no two districts are the same. Um, everyone has their own different agreements, how it's working uh, based on their school district and their philosophies and their approaches and how those districts uh, uh, solve problems. So we're not identical by any means, uh, but we do discuss things on a regular basis. So I don't see any more questions coming through. Oh, here's a new one. Nope, that's it. Um, so while we're, while we're wrapping up in a couple five few minutes, I'm going to share my screen again with you. I'd like to share with you a little more about our COVID recovery plan page. Again, if you come to the district's homepage, um, our main landing page or our main page, um, we, so our school year has started. There's, here's the link for resources for students and our recovery plan page. Also new starting out uh, this week, I'll be posting a weekly video of just kind of news from around the district, what's happening as a way to communicate with families. Um, it'll probably show up on our district Facebook page and our IT staff is able to help us get this dropped on and embedded. So it's all set up. It's nice to have good techie people around because I can't do it all. But here, um, again, this is the information around the new student accounts and how to make that work. And so if you just click on the link, it takes you to the resources that you need about how to do the student accounts. Um, again, this is open to the public, so you don't even need to be the student to read this. So if, you're, if your child's telling you, I don't know my email address, that's right here on the slides. If they're not sure what to do, um, all that information about the, the accounts that they need for their email and the student portal, it's all that information is here, okay? So that's readily available to our students. And then here on the COVID-19 recovery plan page, again, this is where we, we give the basic information from the county. Um, this is how we registered for today's meetings. And if you need to email me, uh, please do. Here's my email address. And just make sure the subject is LCA plan. That's for the learning continuity and attendance plan. Um, this is some basic information around that, around what our planning is, tools and resources that we have. We've updated our school calendar to reflect our, our minimum day Mondays. Um, we talk about the routine of daily live interaction is critical for learning. So getting back onto regular schedules and then links for health and well-being. We have information on student safety. Again, here's the part about the email address. It's gonna to go to the same place. The daily health check. We have it in English and Spanish. You see a typo there. We'll get that fixed here in a minute. 
um, you and I are linked to athletics and employee wellness, which this is just general wellness for everybody as well. So um, we try and keep this page uh, updated as current as we can with current information or information that we've got going on. Um, of course, these are links to the guidance that we received, flyers around this information. Um, we'll post the presentations that are done. And again, it's the guidance documents that were shown in the very first few slides are right here as well. So we tried to provide this as a, a resource for, for families who may have questions, okay? All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, please share this information with others as you have it or point them to this page. We'll get the slides um, again uh, posted here uh, later today that we've got here um, and get that. So they'll be linked right here under learning continuity and attendance plan. So you can see the slides. They'll soon be there in Spanish as well. Para los que solamente habla español. And you can share this with your Spanish speaking friends as well. And we encourage them to come to the, 20, the meetings on the 25th. Um, I will have a translator who can listen to make sure what I'm saying is, is right and can help me explain something if I get a little stuck. Or if there's a question I don't quite understand from a Spanish speaker, then they can help translate uh, really for me and back to the families because my Spanish isn't perfect. Um, and so we, we encourage our Spanish speakers to participate with us next week. Okay. If there's no other questions, we don't have to stay on until the exact 12 o'clock. We may end a minute or two early. All right, so at this point in time, thanks everyone. Appreciate all of you attending and being here um, and, and participating in this presentation so that uh, you can get some firsthand information and share it. These are very good questions and we'll take the information from the chat and we'll be able to follow up with those and provide reminders to our administrators and to our teachers. Thank you everyone for attending and stay tuned. We're gonna figure out how to do back to school night. Back to school nights at our schools have like three and 4,000 people coming on campus. And I don't know if we can do that in a Zoom call. That just is going to be really tough to do. So we'll have to figure out some other approach. But again, thanks everyone for attending. Appreciate it.